going to start off with two questions, and Tom, I'm actually going to direct them at you first. How well does forest management mimic the effects of natural disturbances such as fire? And as a follow-up, are we too good at putting out large fires? Actually, we should give the MNR credit there. In Ontario, in the last decade, they've been very good at putting out fires. Very, very good at it. But if I just go back to your slide a little bit, just to uh, look at it, forestry versus fire is not really the question. Um, in my opinion, it's do we want controlled renewal of the landscape or uncontrolled renewal of the landscape? If we look at what uncontrolled renewal is, we look at what's happened in Alberta in the last year and the uncontrolled wild, wildfires that took place, is that the type of renewal we want or do we want controlled renewal? So in the last almost two decades, we've been trying to mimic fire. Is forestry perfect at doing it? No. Can we control how and when it takes place? Yes, we can. And I think in the last decade, we've gotten better and better with the guidelines. The MNR has a landscape guideline at mimicking nature. Dave, you have a follow-up? I think that uh, Mark or uh, Tom makes some, some good points um, about uh, the limitation of our ability to mimic fire and um, some of the caution, I guess, that, that I would have from our organization's perspective is that, that some of the uncontrolled results of, of catastrophic fire are a direct result of suppression where the fuel load has built up over the years. So I would agree we need some sort of control, uh, but I think there is, a, there is a role for more fire on the landscape. And if you look at other jurisdictions, um, people that are active in the United States tell me in, in Michigan, for example, they, the state will burn everywhere. Um, they'll, they'll use uh, prescribed burns or uh, letting natural fires go, but mostly prescribed burns. So I think there's, there's, a, there's more space in the toolkit to actually use fire on the landscape, not have to rely on forestry necessarily as the primary means of, of renewing the forest. Um, I'm from Toronto, and they do prescribe burns almost every year in High Park uh, with a high level of success. They're expensive, takes a lot of expertise, um, but if you can do it in High Park, you can do it pretty much anywhere. Staying on the forestry topic for, for a moment here, this is a major and ongoing concern of the moose hunting community and it's, it's the impact of herbicides and the spraying of er, aerial herbicides and the effect on moose browse and ultimately moose health. Um, I can probably address or uh, direct this question to anybody, but Tom, I'm gonna start with you. As a professional forester, can you give us um, just some brief insight into what the forest management companies are legislated to do or not to do when it comes to spraying of aerial herbicides? This is a question maybe your whole conference could be on as herbicide. <laughs> it is very uh, long and in-depth. I think this panel, we could probably uh, spend hours and hours debating the issues. But if we back up a tiny bit, and just to give a little tiny bit of background, the forest industry, we harvest 0.5 of a percent of the managed forest in Ontario per year. That's what we harvest. We create thousands of jobs and generate a huge amount to the economy in northwestern Ontario, or actually the entire province. And when you talk about herbicides, that 0.5% we harvest per year, two-thirds of that is not treated with herbicides. One-third of it, that's an average, is treated with herbicides annually. It is a tool in our toolbox that we <coughs> excuse me, we use, and there's a legal framework the forestries have to write their forest management plans under, and we are obligated to renew the forest and bring it back to what its condition was beforehand. So when we're talking about moose and moose browse, we do not spray areas of poplar. If it was a hardwood stand to begin with, it will be a hardwood stand in the next rotation. Where we use herbicides, we use those to treat areas where we have planted spruce, pine, in those areas to release them. And if you look at a lot of the studies that have been done, yes, moose move out of those areas. You know, the herbicides are sprayed, moose move out, but 
in all my years of uh, doing forestry, I have yet to create a monoculture. The species all come back within a couple of years. We create a period of time where the planted <laughs> trees can grow up. The browse does come back and the animals do come back to those areas. I'm, hopefully Pierre can speak about animals coming back into areas and that too, but they do return to those areas. Initially they do move out, but they do return. And if I can go back to Mark's slide at the very beginning, he was looking at moose decline over the years and it, it's interesting that the moose decline correlates almost exactly with the decline in hardwood harvest by the forest companies. When the mills in South America started competing with us and in North America we couldn't keep up with the price of hardwood craft, the harvest of poplar specifically declined and it declined dramatically and it correlates almost exactly with the population of moose peaking at 120,000, dropping now to around 90 something and hasn't gone down to the historic number of 80,000, but it does correlate with those numbers. So I could keep on going about herbicides, but I'll give other people a chance. Fair enough. Go ahead, Pierre. Yeah, I, as a First Nation leader up in our area, you'll find out that we have sent out uh, question after question to the MNR to prove this works because as First Nation, the people are saying you're killing everything. They, they're just talking about the broadleaf, it's the blueberries, every other thing that's in the ground and plus what's in the water. So they're, they're saying this attack is on the land in which they are very vulnerable, they, they really stand up for. And uh, I can agree, I was in, I've cut bush my whole life and, uh, and when you see the spraying, they do move out. And it's like anything, if you've got a big garden in your backyard that's just coming up, you spray it, well you're not gonna be eating there for a while. So if it takes one, two, three, four years for it to come back, so it does, but I, I just, we are totally against spraying, 100%. Thanks for that. Vince, you and I have had some discussions in the past about, <laughs> and you're laughing already, about some research indicating adverse effects of some of these herbicides on moose themselves. So step back from moose brows and let's talk about individual moose themselves. Do you have some insight into what impact these chemicals might be having on moose? I got lots of stuff right here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's uh, my first it was first raised to me by some uh, First Nation community in Manitoba when I was a regional wildlife person on the east side of Lake Winnipeg and then people at uh, Little Black River complained to me about spring and the impact it was having and they particularly referenced turtles. I always remember that. There's been a lot of stuff that's done in the last little while and I can tell you right now that the, um, the World Health Organization has said that that Roundup is potentially carcinogenic and the American Cancer Society has come right out and said it is carcinogenic. And Monsanto was called on the carpet last Monday in California to justify the fact that, uh, you know, uh, if it's carcinogenic or not. And it just concluded, I just got an email a few minutes ago here, it concluded last Friday. One of the things that they have found in big game, and I have... I haven't personally seen it in Manitoba, but I've had other people in Canada sent me photographs. One of the things that's happening with uh, big game animals is at the embryonic stage where it's causing testicular anomalies in bulls and it's causing a overgrowth of the bottom jaw. So that the bottom jaw, you know there's no teeth on the top, but there's a hard pad there. So the bottom jaw is extending over um, uh, forward from the upper upper pad that is and of course that's going to cut down on uh, you know the ability of that animal to function properly and there's um, I have some graphs right here that have been done um, showing the anomalies that have occurred in deer out in I believe it's in Idaho since about 1995 so you know I right now I am working with three First Nation communities in Northwestern Ontario in the Kenora area, and um, they are very adamant that you know, they don't want spraying, but yet the forest companies there in the plan are stating that uh, they've got to go and convince the people out there to use, uh, you know, use, uh, use Roundup, and I can pre appreciate what you're, you're saying about it, but it certainly is a concern from a 
you know, a, a, carcin a carcinogenic perspective. And I think the more that we look at it, you know, we might find that um, uh, I've been alerting people all across the country if they're, if they're dealing with animals to take a look at that lower jaw to see if you see an extension of it. I know it's been seen up in the Prince George area in British Columbia. Go ahead, Tom. I just want to make a comment about science and everybody needs to do all of their uh, research into it. Recently, you know, people have come forward and said, you know, uh, glyphosate causes sterilization and they quote a scientific article. And there is an article, there was a study, and when you look into it, the scientists that did it, they took a rabbit, they abraded the testicles so they're bleeding, and they packed it with glyphosate salt for 30 days, and guess what? They got a result. Similar result, a, a group came to us recently and said, it, you know, glyphosate is causing blindness in rabbits, so when you spray it out there, you know, it's going to cause blindness in rabbits. So you go and look at it, yeah, there was a study. They took pure liquid glyphosate, they put it in the eyes of rabbits, and guess what? They got a result. So you got to read and look at all the studies and see. I haven't heard this one about moose jaws. It would be very good. I think one of the last questions here is where there should be research. There's a good place. Do the research. But there is probably the largest body of scientific research for and against glyphosate of any chemical. It's been on the market since 1970, I believe. It's been studied and it's gone back and forth. And I think uh, it's a tool in our toolbox, as, as my colleague has said. And uh, we've tried other things and I would welcome other things if we could. We've tried sheep. You know, in Northwestern Ontario, we fed some wolves by having sheep out there grazing. You know, we tried that one. Motor manual, when you're out there with brush saws, we've tried that. If you look at Nova Scotia, you'll find that in the research that 87% of their plantations failed because they're not using herbicides. So it's not that everybody likes to say it's the forest company, but it's, it's not that we want to use it. It's the tool in our toolbox. It's reliable, it's effective, and it's cost effective. If we had another tool that we could use, we would use it. Please. Uh, I'd just like to say I think everybody would agree that the less we can use of these chemicals, um, because there is uncertainty about them, um, there's definitely social concerns, um, uh, I think the, the less we can use, the better, and it's actually cheaper for the forest company. And so one of my, one of my gigs uh, is uh, with the, the Forest Stewardship Council um, and, and trying to develop a new standard for certified forest management. And, and in that, it recognizes that glyphosate and other herbicides uh, right now may be necessary, but, but the effort is, is, needs to be made to dial it down as much as possible and reduce it. And eventually, maybe, and in some areas, we could reduce it uh, to zero, uh, which would be, which would be uh, a, a great sign and I think uh, a good benefit to everybody, including moose, uh, potentially. Thanks for that, Dave. Uh, moving on to staying with forestry for a moment again, but um, moving on to forest access roads. Essentially, for lack of a, a better term, the government subsidizes the creation of forest access roads that are used by the forest industry, as well as other industries. And over time, um, actually in fairly short order, those roads become vital to anglers and hunters and other outdoor recreationists who um, use them for various recreational opportunities, accessing uh, good fishing and hunting opportunities, camping, so on and so forth. Dave, is there any value in banning moose hunting in recently harvested forest? I'll try to stick specifically to your question. <laughs> I won't branch out onto uh, on, on roads in general. Uh, if I have time, I'd like to. But there, are, there is a tool that, that um, uh, the local managers use all the time, uh, and, and Tom can attest to this, when there's um, forest operations going on during hunting season, they can close down a certain area um, and the roads for, for hunting. Um, and I think they call them red zones uh, informally. Uh, so that's used all the time to protect 
forest workers uh, ensuring safety during, during forest operations during hunting season. But they can also be used as a management tool, and they can be used in the Wawa district um, uh, to ban or stop moose hunting in a certain area for a certain amount of time till the, the brow or till the, the regen grows up and provides some cover for the moose. So they're not, um, you know, they're a little more hard to see and have a little bit of, uh, more of a chance during hunting season. And from what I've been told, they're, they've been fairly effective. And I think there's one that the OFAH has referenced in um, Ontario out of doors called uh, Newlands Hill in, uh, in the Hearst area. Um, and uh, I don't know how effective it's been on moose. I did talk to the local biology, uh, the bi biologist. Uh, they, they assessed how well the regen was coming back and whether they're going to keep it uh, going anymore. Uh, don't know what the effect was on moose population, but it definitely seems to have a, a logic behind it. Since old Bullwinkle walked across the, land uh, the Bering Land Bridge, he hasn't changed at all. He's still got four feet, antlers, and fur. Look what we got. Cars and trucks and snow machines, Argos, ATVs, aircraft, the whole nine yards, and them damn things called roads. What chances does he have? And remember that we take a, take a look at everybody who hunts out there. He has got a hope in hell. Now, if you go and take a look in the, uh, and I did some digging on this, um, Tim Timmerman and, Mike, and uh, Rick Golett in 1982 published a paper in our journal, Alsace, and they found that in the newly accessed areas had a disproportionately higher moose harvest when compared to roadless areas. And you know what we did in Manitoba um, on the west side of the province before I retired, we went and rip roads. We just didn't rip them to the first corner, but we went a kilometer and ripped them. The good Lord himself couldn't get down those roads. Yes, we had some complaints from trappers that they couldn't get down there. I talked with the uh, NROs in Northwestern Ontario earlier, um, or last week, and you know, there's people that want to get down these roads because they got a permit to take bait fish out and things like this, but what do we want? Do we want a legacy to pass on? And you know, when you put the roads in to these areas where our, our forestry folks are taking things out, you've just got a, you know, you've got a residual population there that you're hoping to keep there so it can take a new advantage of the new growth that's going to come up from harvesting, you know, hardwoods, for example. But if we have access down into those areas, that resource is gone. And that's one of the big concerns that, that I have and many uh, moosers have from across the country. Being from the north and lived there my whole life, and uh, like we grew up and we'd go on Sunday rides with our parents and just go partridge hunting, moose hunting, whatever. And by dismantling of the roads, it'll take away that opportunity for the local people up north. And uh, it takes away from our recreation. Now you look, the way they have it set up now, the way that everything is, they come up, they have everything. Like you, you hit it, they've got quads, they've got every, no matter what you do, and we've dismantled roads. We had, that's an added cost to the contract or whatever. You gotta go back, build a road that costs you a fortune to build, then you gotta go and spend just as much to rip it out, to go back. I've done it, I know. And uh, to go there and, and expect it to change, the guy's got the motives to get in there now. They've got any kind of machine you can think of, they'll get wherever they want to go. They've got machines that almost walk on water, these Argos and everything. They throw a motor behind, they're in there too. So I just think it's, as a being from the north, it, it's an added cost on, not a, I think it changes our way of life up north. And that's something, if you want to live up there and spend the 40, 40 below nights and everything, come up. That's one of the benefits we do have is be able to go for a drive and maybe get a partnership with our kids and our grandkids. Sorry. Sorry, Tom, go ahead, and then Vince. So this, this actually is a good opportunity for all of your members to inf influence forest management planning. When we do forest management planning, there is open houses for every plan. They're actually online, and you can comment on them. But one of the issues in our plans is roads. And if you're not involved, we'll do what we think is right. It's not necessarily what everybody thinks is right, but we will follow the guidelines the MNR has. And when we're told to decommission roads, we'll decommission roads. But if there's comments from the public about certain areas, they will be addressed in the planning. And it's your opportunity to participate in how 
roads either stay in the landscape or removed from the landscape. I think it would be an interesting area thing to study and we used to call them moose seed areas where maybe there is areas where you do wish to I wouldn't say decommission any roads but you may wish to curtail hunting for a short period of time for the moose population in that area so it seeds out to other areas there is there's lots of things but I don't think you know people like to talk about roads and herbicides and that there isn't one thing affecting moose it's multiple things and each one of them needs to be addressed so public input, key. Thanks key, for that. It, it is a great key, reminder. and you have the ability to do it. Yeah, thanks for that. Vince, go ahead. I was just going to make a, a, a comment uh, relative to ripping roads. Um, you know, first of all, if you take a look at some of the slides I have where we ripped them, you know, the good Lord, I'm not kidding you, the good Lord himself couldn't get down these roads. But I had one operator in Manitoba that told me uh, that if you, it takes him, if there's no rubble in the road, you know, rocks and everything piled into it, it, uh, it, it uh, will take him $1,500 to rip a mile for us. And what he used is he used a backhoe and he worked, uh, he worked his way out. Uh, I mean, forest access roads, obviously there's, there's a benefit to getting out to the resource. I use them when I'm going canoeing. I used to use them when I, I used to hunt. But I think we can all agree that there's a, there's a, there's a limit to how many roads you want open and there's a threshold and I don't know if we know and when it comes to moose what the threshold is we know there's a threshold that's been established for grizzly bears there's a threshold for Algonquin wolves we don't know what the threshold is for moose and so I think we agree that reasonable access is what we want and beyond which you know there's a tipping point obviously you're not going to find a moose outside this hotel there's a, there's, a, there's a threshold that's been exceeded in terms of uh, human footprint. And where that is on the landscape out in the bush, I'm not sure where that is, but I think there's, there's an opportunity for research to have a reasonable amount of, amount of access while maintaining the resource, in this case, moose. And I, I don't disagree with you at all. I think, you know, access, sure. Hey, I like to go some of these places too to shoot grouse just like you do, okay? But there's a limit in terms of, of a protecting or put regulations in that there can be no hunting on these roads. Pierre, you had yeah, a rebuttal? I just, uh, like uh, the doctor saying there about $1,500 a kilometer, man, I'd love, to, I'd love to hire that guy to come and work for me in our area. <laughs> because I know I'd for like us, for us, like we, we get, even on a, on a low class, second, second class road, you're up to 40, 45,000 to build a kilometer road. We can't go and dismantle it in, in half a day. It's the geography we were dealt with in Northwest Ontario is rock and swamp, and there's no way you're gonna build a road anywhere for 1,500 or dismantle it for 1,500 when it costs you that much a day just to run a battle. Go ahead, Dave. <coughs> just another point. So the, the province currently subsidized the building of roads, and what we've been pitching to the province is, can you turn it around and can you subsidize the decommissioning? Uh, which would help uh, with Pierre's point. If you can subsidize that decommissioning, again, we're talking about a balance, and maybe it's time to start putting some money into removing roads where it's appropriate and where it's acceptable. So where's the balance? So you, we have a few options, and I think they were all touched on. You can completely decommission a road so that the good Lord himself couldn't even get down it and eliminate access to all kinds of opportunities. Uh, you can leave the road open, and maybe through regulation, close off certain seasons. Or you can deal with issues, species-specific issues, through existing, in this case, Fish and Wildlife Conservation Act regulations and tag allocation processes. Is there a balance for all of those things, or is there one preferred over the other when it comes to moose? Can we deal with it through our moose tag allocation process? Or is it best to simply decommission roads? To comment on roads and decommissioning, we, we could decommission roads and we can try and keep people out, but it is nearly impossible. We, we have tried to keep out people out of areas. The Caribou Zone is an example where we're legislated really to remove all roads that are there. And in one case, we dug up the roads. I, can, I have the pictures. You would think that you can't get there but somebody with a little Kubota backhoe, the COs finally caught them. They had gone through two kilometers rebuilding the road system so that they could access it. So I don't think decommissioning really 
is the solution to the problem. It may be a piece of the puzzle, but you can't keep people out these days. It's just what you said. People have side-by-sides, quads. They have all these different mm -hmm. ways of getting into an area. Controlling an area as a seed area so that it opens up progressively is an option. I think mm -hmm. there is access is the issue. I don't think decommissioning is the issue. I think there's traditional access for people that are entitled to be in the area and there's access that can be afforded to people after maybe there's been a period of green up in the area. Thanks for that, Pierre. You have a, a yeah, final thought on this before we move on? Yeah, with decommissioning also, you've got to watch because once you decommission a road, you limit your access for your firefighters, your everybody else to get in there too. And they were just talking earlier about how much they, they've gained on putting fires out. Well, if you start decommissioning roads, people aren't going to be able to get in to help you do that. So that's just all. No, thanks for that. So moving on from forestry, uh, I don't think, I'm pretty sure Tom was right in that we could have uh, discussed forest management and uh, moose habitat all day. But uh, we do have several other questions we uh, ideally can get to. Pierre, I'm going to address this to you. I, I personally see tremendous opportunity for increased involvement by Indigenous peoples in provincial moose management, whether it's tag allocations or broader level discussions um, about how to, how to manage moose and moose habitat and so on. So Pierre, in your opinion, is it possible to create a collaborative environment where both Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous stakeholders like the OFAH and other groups can work together on moose management? And if so, do you have any advice on how we can get there? I think totally. I, I think, like, as, as my years of being chief, we approach the ministry every year about being a part of the helicopter flying to get the actual moose counts. We're denied every time. I mean, if you want to bring them in, bring them in at the ground level. Let's be a partner on this. Let's not just come in, like I know I say it all the time, come in, throw something on my desk, saying, here it is, guys, now you do it. I, I think, and, and don't get me wrong, there's a lot of animosity between the two over all the years. Uh, I think they have to share the information. Like there has to be, it has to be a two-stage part. You can't just come in and tell us this is the way it is. And that's the way, like, you know, the numbers, people, if you believe it, you see it, you believe it. So I think that's the part that has, and I definitely do think a co-manager would be great. Bring the First Nation, there's a lot of data they have from being there forever, and a lot of it's passed on. And uh, I do think there is. I know like in our little community where we are, Everybody says, oh, look at all the moose that are shot there over here. There might be 18, 20, but there's one moose hanger. There's one, everybody uses this one ramp. Like, so, I mean, every time you go by, look at there's two moose hanging there. But that's four or 500 people. And these people live off, they don't just, it's not a recreation for them. They, like, we have families there that eat two moose a year. Like, you know, so it's, it's something that they feel deeply about it. And they would love to be part of anything that can sustain it for a long period of time, because that's, like I say, that's their livelihood. Thanks for that. Um, you mentioned co-management. Let's stick on that for two seconds. I mean, so I'm going to address this to you. Do you have any advice on um, other models, co-management models that might work that you've seen in your experience, whether it was with caribou or, or moose management? You know, one of the things that I initiated in Manitoba uh, oh, back in the, I guess it was the early 80s, was a co-management board. And it was rather interesting. I was approached by a chief who asked me to work with him. So I went to the senior people in the department and they said, no, you can't talk to them. So I sat and cooled my heels for a little bit and uh, eventually I got to work with them and we had everybody at the table. And it worked out really well. We limited the harvest by First Nation peoples, how many they could take out of these areas. And it was, it was really, really good. And, um, um, but one of the things that I found now since I retired and working with the Manitoba Wildlife Federation as, I, as their uh, wildlife consultant and their elder, um, as long as government is not at the table, it's amazing how the Federation and, and the uh, First Nation peoples can get along. And I think that there has to, I mean, there, it's, you know, we're not 100 years ago, we're in 20, you know, uh, 18. We've all got to get at the table to work something out. And, you know, I, I know from, I mean, these three communities in Northwestern Ontario recently commissioned me to 
work with them and try and restore the moose population at that area. And what I've suggested to them is that once I've done this document, it's supposed to be submitted next week, you've got to get at the table, everybody at the table initially, rather than this finger pointing, okay? Let's get at the table and be respectful, be honest, you know, and, uh, and look at what the issues are and how can we move forward? Because I know from talking with these people in Wabaskang, Whitefish, and um, Grassy Narrows, they want those resources there just the same as you for those little kids running around the floor. So we've got to change. And if they're not at the table, I'm sorry that that's, it, it, nothing's going to work. And then if we're together, we can go forward to government with some ideas. And that's what we're doing now in Manitoba. Thanks for that. Tom, you had uh, well, I just, some thoughts? Uh, yeah, just, I'd just like to support both of them here. And I'd like to, uh, this is just short, it, uh, I'd like to quote a colleague in uh, recently talking to me, and she's quoted that this, the answer to this question is a no-brainer. It's basically, yes, you know, we, we'd be stupid not to have them with us at the table. Like, that's, it's a no-brainer. Perfect. Yeah, I asked it more as a rhetorical question, but yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it is. It's a no-brainer. <laughs> Yeah, I, I really like the, the direction of this conversation, and uh, I don't, I don't know, I don't profess to know a lot about this issue, but I know of two models in Ontario, uh, one that had uptake and one that didn't, but one with the Northeast uh, Superior Regional Chiefs Forum, where they had their own uh, moose recovery uh, project, and they had some very innovative um, thoughts about um, First Nation hunting within their own community and and forest management and for whatever reason it didn't it didn't get off the ground and um, it, it but it seemed like a really good model and then the other is and I don't know too much about it, the Algonquins of Ontario are one of uh, and voluntary and it has to be voluntary and it has to be from the community um, given given the rights the legal rights and I think um, as Pierre was saying you know a sort of hierarchy of, of needs a lot of these Families depend on moose, but they've voluntarily um, limited their their moose harvest uh, in in and around Algonquin Park. So these are two models that possibly could be looked at and, and uh, explored further. Thanks, Dave. Vince, quick final thought on this topic, then I'll I'll run to Pierre. Yeah, it's um, I developed a moose plan for Manitoba. One of the things that I put in that back of that plan for discussion purposes only. I put some ideas forward with the Mi'kmaq Indians that put forward for their hunting in the Cape Breton Highlands area. Same rules that apply to me and you. Season dates, quotas, the whole nine yards, vehicle restrictions, the whole business. And it was for discussion purposes only. The deputy minister at the, at the, at the time took it right out and didn't even want to discuss it, which was a bloody tragedy. And some of the things I had in there was Hey, and I used three examples on the east side, three communities there. I said, well, hire a biologist to work with those three communities. And he would allocate the tags, he would monitor the kill, all those sort of things. More contemporary type stuff. You know, that's what we've got to look at now. We have every year we have what they call an annual harvest for the community. And we all go out, the young, the old, and everybody, and try to get at least two, three moose that we can share amongst the people that can't go, the elders and everything. So last two times we've said, okay guys, no cows. So we were at a meeting there and all of a sudden one guy puts his hand up and says, why are we limiting ourselves to no cows when every time we turn around, they're throwing out more cow tags on the, on this, on the right. So I mean, there we go, well, uh, it's, we're looking for ourselves. Like, and we can't do what other people do. So it, just, it was just a question that was really hard to answer. Like we limit ourselves, but other people are just throwing them out like water out in our area, like, you know. I think there's 15 or 1600 cow tags in the area where we are, so it's, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Pierre. Moving on, and this isn't an easy question by any means, um, and again, it's probably one we could discuss the rest of the day, all the right, right through cocktail hour, I bet. <clears throat> how do we balance the need, and Dave, I'm gonna direct this at you uh, for starters, how do we balance the need to protect and restore species at risk, such as caribou, while or balancing it with the sustainable use of species like moose and deer. Can we? Uh, I, I think we can. I think um, the zonation approach, when you w approach where you, where you look at where caribou exists in the province, in the area of the undertaking, in the area of the managed forest, they have been pushed to the very far 
uh, northern parts. Uh, where most people uh, hunt deer and they hunt moose is not in the caribou zone. I know there's some exceptions. I'm, I'm making some broad statements here. But I remember talking to somebody in, um, in, uh, outside of Ignis. I was on an FSC audit. And they had no intention of driving up to caribou country to hunt moose. I mean, it was just too far, uh, too much gas, and the moose population isn't that good. I mean, um, where the caribou are still existing, the forest is still intact, there's not that much disturbance, and generally the moose population is, isn't that high. So I think there's a sort of a zonation question here. And the survey ecological framework that MNR has put put forward, I think generally it's a good idea. I see some areas where it could be tweaked. I see where they have um, targets for low or, or uh, medium moose densities. Uh, to me, they don't make sense because in, in, in my opinion, in my experience, there's no caribou there. There's no reason to really keep the, the moose population low. So I think there can be some tweaking that, to be done to that, yep. uh, that framework and the zones. To, uh, to reflect where the animals actually are, where the caribou are, where the moose are, where people want to hunt. But I think, I think it's basically a zonation issue. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, Here? well, up where we are, it's becoming a really contentious issue is caribou. In regards to, like I say, I've logged since 73 when I quit school, but I mean, I've never seen one. Never seen one in all my years of being around Nipigon, Beardmore. I know they, there's some northern, but now with all these, there's zones you'll see on a map, there'll be a big stripe from the north all the way to the south because there is some on a couple islands out there. And it'll be caribou zones where it's a whole different criteria and everything. And it's really changing uh, a lot of things. And you come up in our area, you talk to most people that are avid hunters, outdoorsmen, they figure with the way that the tag allocation is, that it's the plan is to wipe out the herd of moose so that the caribou can move in. Not just First Nation, it's everybody out there who are avid hunters and fishermen. And right now, as everybody would have seen, I don't know how that's going to work in regards to, they just flew caribou from Mitch McCotton Island down into our area, which is, 20, in the, it's on the water, of course, but it's not 21A, but it's directly in the 21A area. So a lot of people are wondering now, are just these numbers of caribou now in our area just grew? They flew in, like, first class. But, I mean, now they're there. And, and it's really a lot of people are wondering, where's this going to go? You've never seen a moose fly across the country, but they've been flying caribou, so. It's, it's a really tough area for we are. And we don't want it to hurt our moose herd. Tom, go ahead. So from the forest industry's perspective, it's a difficult topic, species at risk, because in Ontario, we have the Species at Risk Act. And as an industry, it handcuffs us, really, in what we can and cannot do. And I would agree there we could, if we could revisit the act, change the act, and go back working under the Crown Forest Sustainability Act, we could probably manage for all species. But right now, we have one act that is superseding everything else, which is putting, forcing us down this road that Pierre's talking about because some artificial lines have been drawn on a map that we're going to manage these areas differently for one species and one species only. It is not sustainable forestry. It is management for one species at risk. Thanks for that. So conflicts between different legislative pieces. Correct, which, is another, which is another place where this organization can get involved and can make a difference. Thanks for that. Two final thoughts on this, Vince and then Dave. Uh, a few years ago, I headed, before I retired, I headed up the forest wildlife program in Manitoba. And um, I have a paper published in our moose journal on this. If you only manage four moose, you can accommodate 66% of the other wildlife species in the boreal area. So what we came up with is if you manage for moose, pileated woodpeckers, and caribou, you can accommodate about 90% or 95% of the other forest wildlife species. And it beats going to you as foresters saying, we've got 293 species out there, we want a management plan for all of them. Each one. You're going to be pulling your hair out. So, you know, this is one of the benefits, I think, of, you know, of what, uh, what Dave has talked about and uh, Pierre has, uh, has alluded to is, is this kind of a zonation type mm -hmm. thing. And we want those resources to pass on to future generations. 
what a bloody legacy to leave if they're not there. What are those generations that follow us are going to say? I'll tell you what they'll say right now. You know. Dave, go ahead. Uh, I, I just want to respond to something uh, Tom said about the Species at Risk Act. Um, as most of you know, that most industry in Ontario has been exempt from the Species at Risk Act for, um, well, forever. And they've just rolled it in. They've extended that exemption for two years. So I don't understand how the Species at Risk Act is having any impact on the forest industry at this point. Um, we, we are big supporters of uh, the Species at Risk Act, and we think it hasn't been incorporated uh, to the extent that it should be. <laughs> now, that being said, I appreciate um, Pierre's conflict, and we think um, that sometimes um, a more nuanced approach, a local approach, could solve some of these some of these issues, and we've we've developed a plan with Tembak and with First Nations, uh, the northern communities in northeastern Ontario, which uh, both benefits caribou, benefits the forest industry, benefits everybody involved, and it's just creative thinking, which I applaud OFH for getting a bunch of us at the at the table, and uh, I think uh, people from different perspectives around the table can come up with very very creative solutions. Uh, if given the chance. I'm going to give you one quick opportunity for rebuttal, Tom. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, this is where Dave and I sort of part ways a little <laughs> bit, and he knows that I was going to take exception to it because the forestry, the word exemption isn't the correct word, and I know it's always used. We're exempt from the Act. We're not exempt from the Act. There is a rules and regulations, Section 55, which is basically telling us there is another Act you have to work under. We still can't harm, harass. We still have way too many almost constrictions and rules and everything else we have to follow under the Crown Forest Sustainability Act. There is another act, and that is what that rules and regulations is saying, is that, well, you already have something that you follow and go through, you can use it. There is other industries that are, have that same rules and regulations. The agriculture industry has it. But for us, it's not that it's a free-for-all out there, which some people would say, you know, forest industry can go out there and do whatever they want. It's far from it. We have so many rules, you wouldn't believe how hard it is to write a forest management plan. It costs industry, each plan, about uh, three-quarters of a million dollars and over three years to write each plan. It's, it's a lot of work to try, and I... We do what just what my colleague here was saying. We try and do it for each individual species, and it's a nightmare to try and do it. But we are not exempt, and it's a free for all. Thanks, Matt. Tom, um, as Patrick mentioned uh, in his uh, sort of context setting presentation, the MNRF shortened the open calf season to two weeks across much of northern Ontario, and early indications are that calf harvest has decreased dramatically in many units, if not most. Dave, I know that the Wildlands League. Um, has been very vocal in their opposition to the open calf harvest system that we have. In fact, that's how I first met you and got uh, uh, networked with you. Can you give us some brief insight into the Wildlands League's position on this uh, before I open it up to others for a broader discussion? Yeah, and I would characterize it as, a, as an interest rather than position because I don't think we're inflexible necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, but we did, we looked at, at all the options available to managing moose. And we thought, what can be done in the short term that has seems to have fairly high social buy-in and high ecological credibility? And there's a bunch of options on the table. And, and are, is within the wheelhouse of MNR to be able to enact it fairly quickly. And we, we came, came down to a few things, but one was, um, why are we still hunting calves in a, in a situation where we have a reduced, uh, declining population? And um, I, I appreciate the, the effort of, of shortening the, the calf season. Um, our, our hypothesis was that people would just change when they're going to hunt to a more intensive hunt over those two weeks. Now, it does look like there's some encouraging signs, but we don't know if that's because um, people are, are not hunting calves because of the shortened season or because they recognize, um, like Pierre's, um, community recognize a, 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 a drop in the population and are vol voluntarily 
not hunting calves anymore. Mm-hmm. So we did a survey which, which had almost 50% hunters respond that said that they would be in favor of, of, of the policy tools that we put in front of them in the survey, uh, <clears throat> that um, ending the calf harvest would be the number one thing that they'd be in favor of. Um, and just informally talking to hunters, um, a lot of people say, yeah, frankly, I go out in the bush, but I have no intention of shooting a calf, especially now that the, that the population is declining. Yeah, I think the reality is that there are obviously tens of thousands of moose hunters that have absolutely no interest in actually harvesting a calf. Yeah. Otherwise, we'd have no moose left, um, maybe declined or disappeared at this point. Um, but in your mind, or in, in, I guess, the opinion of your organization, is it ever possible anywhere to harvest calf moose sustainably? Um, if you had a, a hyperabundant population, like in Newfoundland, potentially, uh, yeah. So, so it's extreme not, situations. It, yeah, it's it's a biological um, uh, issue for for us. We're not anti-hunting um, as an organization. As I said, I used to hunt myself. Um, uh, the only deer I ever shot was a, a doe a fawn, actually. And I got a lot of ribbing from the other guys in the hunt camp over it. But at that point, I said, well, it was probably going to die anyways, which is sort of the rationale behind the calf harvest. But what we didn't know when we, we as, a, as a province, when we brought it forward, is that most of the calves get, hunt, get predated or die before hunting season. So that that the, the calves that are taken during hunting season are additional mortality. It's not compensatory. I have so, serious problems with that conclusion, anyways, but, it's, but not my, it's not my forum, so <laughs> I we, do, we however. We can chat about it, but I anyways, do, however, that's, that's our perspective, and, and there does seem to be some, in, in the, the few, I think there's five uh, wildlife management units where there is restrictions on the calf hunt, mm-hmm. uh, cool. it does seem to have, um, I mean, again, it's correlation, not causation, but there seems to be, since they brought it in, and in increase in the cow and, and bull tags, so an increase in the yeah. adult tags. Um, so it, it does seem that some some control on the calf hunt seems to be um, something that could be brought in, at least in some wildlife management units, where we, we have some issues. Thanks for that. Pierre, I'm, I've always been curious about what Indigenous peoples and Indigenous communities, moose harvesters, think about non-Indigenous harvest of moose calves, what, in general, or the open calf moose season that we have? Well, I think it's just like the chicken or the egg thing. Like, you know, you can go out and stop all shooting the calves, but quadruple the cow tags, well, you can have less calves the next year. Like, you know, you got to look at the whole concept of it. Like, I know we, we, we've been trying to cut back on the cow and the calf shooting, for sure, don't question me wrong. But, I mean, it, it's, that, that's the big question here. You don't just keep handing out cow tags like they're going out of style and expect that the calves are going to be there next year. They're not going to be, and, uh, and and like you, you hit the nail right in the head, Dave, in regards to how many of them are going to survive if you got a late calf and all of a sudden comes, you get an early winter, is that calf going to survive without the cow? Probably not. So you just, by killing the cow, you just kill two animals. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's such a hard question to answer. Uh, I think the reduction of cow tags for sure is strongly in our belief. Like, you, you can't keep giving out that many cow tags and expect the herd to survive. Mm-hmm. There are some wildlife management units in Ontario, specifically in the Northwest, where we have essentially very few moose left. For whatever reason, you can blame it on all kinds of different factors. Largely, they're probably unknown, but they're talking very, very small moose populations, some of these uh, Kenora District units that I know you're familiar with. One of the things that um, you did when I was uh, working with you in Manitoba is we implemented some conservation closures of various game hunting areas in the province, and I know that since I've left Manitoba, they've been expanded to different areas. Can you give us some insight into uh, the type of groundwork that is required to implement something like that, um, given that technically it's an infringement of um, treaty rights? Well, in actual fact, it... it <laughs> I'm not sure if I would call it an infringement of treaty rights. It's a conservation measure that we did under Sparrow, the 1990 uh, decision of Sparrow, where we could implement a, a closure for conservation purposes that applies to everybody. And what we did before then, we went around and we talked with many First Nation communities on the west side of the province and um, and told them why we wanted to do it and wanted their support. 
They didn't have to agree. All we had to do was consult. And when you consult, that, you know, the final decision rests with government. But as long as you go out and consult, and that's what we did, and it, and it applies to everybody. On all the Duck Mountains, the Porcupine, the Swan Pelican, we have a small area on the east side of the province where we only closed 15%, which was a wrong move. The whole damn thing should have been closed. But it worked very well, and um, those populations in those areas, where we had a base, enough a base population to build it up again, for example, the Duck Mountains, mm -hmm. It's come up. It's we've about we've about doubled it in in uh, six years. In the Swan Pelican, where it was so low, we did not um, we have not increased that. But one of the other things that we did on this, what I did is that I brought a fellow in from Al from Alberta to go around and run wolf trapping schools in various places in the province, and then we went to registered trappers. Vince Crichton couldn't go and shoot a wolf in these areas. But a, a person that, these are all registered trap lines, the registered trapper could go and shoot a wolf and he get paid 250 bucks for it. But for that, he had to turn in a piece of tongue, piece of bone, piece of hair, the jaw, I think. And, and we have a new technique. You can look at what the animal's eating now by looking at the hair. And I have the figure here uh, over the space, in the west side of the province, over the space of, uh, up until the, they uh, stopped the season in 2015, we've taken over, over 700 wolves. Now, um, when I went to the minister and broached the idea with him, and I said, it is time bounded. We do not want to wipe out wolves. Wolf or, wolves are a part of the ecosystem out there. It's time bounded until wolves get up to, a, moose get up to a level again where population you know, can handle them. And he looked at me and he said, Vince, it's a no brainer, do it. And it seems to have worked uh, fairly well. What I would have done differently, rather than apply it broad scale like that, I would have gone in, and government didn't want to do it that way, I would have gone in and moved total packs. Rather than maybe trap or shoot the alpha male, alpha female, and you're going to get some others breeding in there. And, um, but, um, you know, they didn't want to go that route. But it's been effective, and we've got support of First Nation peoples. The issue we've got right now is it's up like that. Everybody wants to go in and shoot the hell out of the population again. And I've been telling them out there, if you're going to go and do it, open up again without limits that are applicable to everybody, you know, four or five years are going to be in the same hole again. What have we gained? Nothing. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. So, Pierre, from your perspective, uh, in, in your neck of the woods at least, how willing would Indigenous communities be to discussing an option like this? I'm sure, it, like anything, if, if, if they could be part of the data collecting that shows they need it, mm -hmm. that, that would definitely work. I'm sure it would, because uh, they are there for the long stance, of, they're there for, for, for the long stay. They're not here for the short term, and to them it's not a money grab, it's just a way of life. So it's, it's a total, it's going to be a contentious issue, don't get me wrong. You're going to get the ones that will rebuttal against it and mm -hmm. some that won't. And it's proven wherever you go. They, they did that in Newfoundland. All the local people still went and poached their moose. Some are going to be poachers. Some are, are going to do it. There's no, you can't put everybody in the same thing. But I definitely think they would be very receptive if it was done right. They were all part of the, the data that was collected to, to put this in place. I think they'd have no problem with it. Good, thanks. So, Dave, Vince mentioned um, this wolf trapping incentive. Um, in the province of Manitoba. From your perspective, whether it's a personal opinion or an organizational opinion, does predator control, and I'm talking about targeted predator control, or in this, in, in a case like Vince described, sort of increased sustainable use of, uh, or trapping of wolves, do programs like that have any place in moose management in Ontario? Um, I, I don't, I don't think, I mean, Vince mentioned it was very, it was time bound, it was very limited, uh, didn't want to wipe out wolves completely, um, and, and I appreciate that sentiment. Um, our, the organization I work for um, would say that, that in order to be effective, you've got to, you've got to kill so many wolves that um, it's really from an ecological point of view, it's, it's not really acceptable. Um, uh, I think I think personally you could get to the point where it might be necessary to do some predator control for a limited time if 
to prevent a uh, local population from getting so low that it, it can't recover, and especially if it's a species at risk. And uh, thank goodness moose aren't there yet. Um, but uh, I, that would, I guess the only caveat I would have is, is in, a, in an extreme situation, it might be appropriate for a very limited period of time. That's my personal, personal thought. Fair enough. Tom. So this is just my personal opinion. <laughs> And uh, I actually don't live in a city. I live uh, 30 kilometers south of Thunder Bay, and I have a wolf pack that's on my property. And they just moved in in the last couple of years. The wolves are a lot more prevalent in and around communities now because of the food sources going down. We have lynx right in Thunder Bay now. There's a case where the lynx mistaked a little tiny white dog, I think, for a rabbit, and the dog was on a leash because the animals are right in the city. So I think there is a place for, this is my personal opinion, for predator control. And without that piece, we can create, the forest industry can create browse forever, but if there's none of these other pieces in place too, it won't work. It's, it's one of those things you have to have an integrated approach. You have to look at everything. Go ahead, Miss. Somebody said to me a while ago, oh, you got a hundred moose out there. That's enough to turn it around. Let's just take a look at that hundred moose for a minute. Now, first of all, I went and I used my own data so I know it's right. I collected it from an aircraft. <laughs> so I broke it down into the percentage in the hundred moose, the percentage of bulls, the percentage of cows, the percentage of calves. Then I looked at the those percentage of cows, neither nobody in this room, you, me, or anybody else, can tell whether that cow out there is a year and a half old or a four and a half year old. We don't have that expertise. But what I did was I said, okay, there's gonna be a percentage of those cows that are not gonna be breeders. I accepted the fact that they're gonna breed the first time at two and a half. Some will breed at one and a half, but let's say two and a half. Those Breeding cows in that 100 population in December, when I would fly surveys, they, there is nine calves on the landscape. That is not enough to offset predation by black bears, wolves, accidents, vehicle collisions, and hunting. It's just simply not. I have an example in Manitoba where I closed it in 1975, tried to close it a year earlier, and the people in the wildlife branch told me I was a young kid in the street and I didn't know what I was talking about. Well, I got it closed. It still has not recovered in 40 years. And we have other areas in Manitoba that are in the same boat right now as a result of flying this uh, last winter. They will not recover. They're just too low and will not off, uh, you know, with the, uh, and when, the other thing, remember, up in that, uh, well, in the Kenora area, Kenora area and Thunder Bay area, we've got a lot of brainworm. Now, when populations, they go like this, lots of calves and, you know, not many of those older animals out here. But as populations go down, there's this many calves and all those old girls that produce twins, they're gone out of the population. But let's just take a look at calves for a minute. They are the ones that are most susceptible to brainworm. And if they pick up brainworm, boy, that's the end of the game. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm glad you alluded to the one that's, uh, is the bear. Like now we might be seeing more calves because the predator, they open the spring bear hunt now. You're not going to be walking down the road and seeing 100 bears here and there. And, and I've seen it myself where they, they do eat calves and they eat a lot of them. So that's one predator that's going to be maybe knocked back a bit. But in regards to wolves, I think, I'm not quite sure about it. Didn't they used to be, used to get a small game tag, could shoot a wolf? Now you can't no more. You have to get a game tag and everything. And yeah. people aren't going to pay $250 yeah. to shoot a wolf, even yeah. though they're all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. And right now trappers, some of them got mange, aren't getting nothing for them. So they're deteriorating from trapping them. So all these things are moving into place that the, the wolf herd, I mean, pack is just going to keep getting bigger. One final comment, Vince? Yeah, there was a Stewart study that is just published in our Moose Journal that was done by Bob Stewart in Saskatchewan. What they did is that they had a control area and they had an experimental area where they reduced black bears in there. They reduced, they took 13 black bears out. After they went back in and those cows had been on a full cycle again in the control, or in the, uh, in the control area, they were running 80 calves per 100 cows. In the other area where they, where they didn't remove them, 40 calves per 100 cows. And Dave Meech is, I just uh, I have it here in my pile of stuff. 
Dave Meech is, uh, here it is, reevaluating the northeastern Minnesota moose decline in the role of wolves. Mm -hmm. And he's got some really good data in yep. there to show that the impact that wolves are having on those calves. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Vince. Final comment before we wrap up. Dave, you have something to say? Yeah, I just, I just read, read, read that Dave Meach um, article, but he did talk about it being a natural sort of uh, fluctuation so that the wolf's population goes up, moose population goes down, then the wolf population crashes, moose population goes up. So if we, if we remove the, the, you know, the social, social imperative to have a lot of moose on the landscape, um, I mean, the moose and, uh, and predators are, will get along just fine. That's my final comment. Thanks for that. I have several questions left that we are not going to get to. Unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap things up because I would prefer to give the, op the uh, audience an opportunity to ask maybe two or three questions. If people are ready to grill our panelists here, uh, feel free to step up to the mic. Rob Hare. Good afternoon. I'm Rob Hare. I live in Keswick, Ontario. I was an avid moose hunter, Tomogamy area. We can't buy a tag there for love nor money. My question is moose surveys, as far as aerial surveys. So we, we, we know that the ministry allocates money for that. Sometimes we can fly them based on weather conditions. Sometimes we can't. Sometimes we pick a wrong block. Lots of sometimes. Is there not satellite technology out there that we could utilize that would be far more efficient to, to actually get a solid survey on the animals that are on the landscape. One, it's going to do that. Two, it's going to take people and aircraft out of harm's way to do that. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Anybody have any insight into that? I don't. So. <laughs> the only, I, I, that technology is not there yet, but I can tell you one of the things that they're doing, and we've had a gentleman that's come periodically to the Moose Conference talking about it, is they're using infrared technology down in New Hampshire and I believe it is Vermont, some of those states down there. And that is something that, we're, that they're looking at. And the other thing I found out from talking with them, when you do that survey, you don't necessarily have to have snow on the ground. But what you have to be able to do is to differenti differentiate the signature of a moose, say from a deer or from, you know, me standing out there, whoever it might be, okay? That's one of the issues. But I think as we go along, that technology is improving all the time. Thanks, Vince. Joe. Joe Wilson. Uh, Tom, you made the statement earlier that when you spray with herbicides, uh, that the moose, after the, the uh, pine and spruce are replanted, and you've sprayed the area, that the moose will come back in two to three years. And uh, I've watched, I've uh, got a moose camp west of Horn Payne for the last 43 years, I guess, and I've watched these areas that thousands of acres were harvested and then sprayed, I think it's Apex helicopters from maybe out of Wingham, spray it for one year, and then if it needs to be sprayed for two years, they do that again. And my observation is, I've watched this over other areas in our, the area we hunt in, once they plant those trees and they get growing up a bit, I don't know where you're seeing these coming back in two or three years, but once these trees grow up, they're planted about every two inches apart, it seems, and I do not see moose tracks there ever again. Thanks, I, I would like Vince's uh, comment on that. Well, I think as... It's been indicated, you know, if you've got a, a, a monoculture out there of straight jack pine or whatever it might be, you're not going to see them come back into those sort of areas. But, um, you, know, I, I, you know, where you get this monoculture coming up in that, and eventually those, um, you know, you've got to have something there for the moose to eat. Otherwise, it's not going to be exactly. there. Exactly. Tom? So all I can say to that is that in the studies that have been done by the MNR and there's quite a few of them where they've actually studied and looked at moose returning into the areas that moose do return and use those areas. Will it happen in every case? Maybe not, but in a lot of cases uh, the browse that comes back, the moose come back and browse those areas and 
in my neck, I can't speak for Horn Payne area in the eastern part. In northwestern Ontario, the moose do come back and use the cutovers. They don't come back the, the year after, they come back years after, but they do use the area when the browse gets to the right height. And Thanks. that's down there. Gotta, get those, gotta get those studies for work down in there on it. Yes, and, those, and I don't know if they sprayed down there or not, but you know, the, uh, when access is restricted, et cetera, and you've protected that, that base that's there, yeah, then they'll come back and use those areas. Thanks for that, guys. Just Dan, you have a question? I do. I'm really encouraged by this discussion. There's a lot of questions I have. I'll ask you one for now to give the next person a chance. Tom, you say 4.5% of forest is, is sprayed, basically the hardwood areas, the small areas that you spray? Is that what you, the comment you made? No, it, it, we basically treat in Ontario, it's around 30% of what is harvested gets treated with herbicides. That's a, it's, a, it's a statistical number, that's what we treat. We, we harvest only 0.5 of a percent of the forested area. In I agree totally with you in regards to the fact that we need to have harvesting. That's why our moose populations, uh, part of the puzzle is declining. There's no question in my mind. But when we're talking spray, I too moose hunt all across Ontario. And there's no doubt moose avoid those areas like the plague. And you're concentrating those moose out of those areas into the fringe areas, which are making them more vulnerable. That's one issue. The other issue is if you're putting a spray on, as Vince indicated, that's creating cancer for moose, what's it doing to the indigenous peoples that harvest things in that area, not only fruits and so on, but also small mammals and so on that utilize those areas that are eating those, that vegetation. What studies have been done to do that on behalf of the forest industry? Perhaps the forest industry should be doing a bit more to reduce the sprays and find an alternative to using sprays in some of those areas that are prime moose habitat, which these hardwood areas are. Thanks, Dan. Tom, do you have anything to say to that, or do you just want to leave that and move no, on? No, I, I do have. <laughs> so I you we, we have reduced in the last 20 years our herbicide use by 50%. That's what we have used it. We only use, we don't use herbicides in, in hardwood areas that are harvested. Like where Pierre harvests pure poplar, those areas come back to pure poplar. We do not spray them. Areas that were almost entirely conifer. They may have had a 10% poplar or birch. It's usually grass, raspberry, birch, and poplar is what we're trying to suppress for a short period of time. Those are the areas we treat. So a mature conifer stand is not an area that moose were using to, at maturity anyhow. And when we cut it, we're just trying to protect the growing species and the moose do come back. Thanks for that, Tom. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap things up so that we can stay on schedule, but I do know that at the very least, Dave, Pierre, and Vince are sticking around for dinner tonight, I think, so I, I encourage you to chat with them if you get a chance. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the panelists for participating and for the engaging discussion and for sharing their insight. So please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>